everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Liz O'Riordan is a triathlete, avid baker, and a breast surgeon in the UK. In 2015, she was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. A combination of surgery, chemo, and radiation treatments seemingly cured the cancer. Liz did a TED Talk. She co-authored a book. Then, just a few years later, the cancer came back. All this has left Liz with numerous long-term complications, including chronic pain and lymphedema. And at the age of just 45, after years of medical training, she's no longer able to work as a surgeon. How does one navigate a potentially life-threatening, career-destroying bump in the road and find some wisdom along the way? Welcome, Liz. Thank you so much for being on today. Um, Let's start with just an overview uh, of your story. Hi, Pat. It's a pleasure to be on here. Um, I was a consultant breast surgeon, and at the age of 40, I was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer myself. And it was a huge shock because I knew too much. I had treated patients with primary and secondary breast cancer. And suddenly I was about to go through every single treatment I gave my patients. And I knew everything. I knew my risk of recurrence. I knew what might happen to me. And my husband and my parents knew nothing. And that power balance of knowledge was really, really hard. And I was treated by doctors and nurses I'd worked with. And they found it very hard to treat me. I had nine months of chemotherapy, um, a mastectomy and reconstruction and radiotherapy, and I went back to work six months later. And a year after that, um, so three years after my diagnosis, my cancer came back locally on my chest wall, and that meant further surgery. I lost my reconstruction. It meant more radiotherapy because it grew in the same area. It meant having my ovaries out, and it also meant I had to retire as a surgeon because the side effects of three operations in my armpit and radiotherapy meant I couldn't move my shoulder properly. And suddenly at 45, cancer had robbed me of the only thing I ever wanted to do since I was a little girl. Where do you go from there? (laughs) I don't know. I think it first hit me when my treatment had finished and I had six months off to get my energy levels back. And I just thought, who am I? Because whenever I met people, inevitably you say, oh, I'm a surgeon, I'm a doctor. You define, I define myself by work. And I'd spent 20 years training through medical school and hospitals to be a surgeon. And I had wrongly stopped all the hobbies I used to do at school. I didn't have many friends. It was all job exam, job exam, write a paper, do a PhD, get the next job. And I'd moved all the way across the country. So in the UK, it's about a six hour drive, which is probably nothing where you are, but for me, it's big. So I'd left all my friends behind and I realized I had no hobbies. I had no social life. I'd lost my job. I was the most boring dinner party guest you could find. (laughs) And I kind of realized that work isn't everything. And I didn't need the money I was bringing in because I wasn't getting paid when I was off sick leave for such a long time. And I actually started finding myself and I started reading and drawing and playing the piano again. And I found more friends and I started writing and writing for me was the massive outlet because it wasn't real I couldn't have cancer I actually think I still haven't really had cancer unless I look in the mirror it's it's like my body just my mind protecting me and writing was a way of getting it down on paper and dealing with it and I started a blog which picked up Um, people reading it and I got awards and the blog led to me doing a TEDx talk and that has now led to me speaking all over the world about a huge host of things from how to improve cancer care in huge hospitals to artificial intelligence to telling children how to cope when things go wrong and I'm almost busier now I've retired than I was as a consultant surgeon. How are you enjoying the public speaking? I love it. It's that it's that theatre. So the buzz I used to get in an operating theatre when you walk in and there's the nerves and you do an amazing operation, you think, wow, I nailed that. I love getting in front of a crowd, but I work really, really hard. It probably takes about 20 or 30 hours to prepare each talk. And I do it from fresh every time I talk. 
But to have a room full of people in your hand and make them laugh and make them cry and know they're going to take away your messages, oh, it's it's like a drug. <laughs> you know, you talked about the power imbalance as you were going through treatment. Yeah. But there was another piece of that that maybe was that maybe you hadn't seen before, and that was the the more emotional aspect and the personal aspect of going through cancer treatment. I don't think any of us are prepared for yeah. that. You're so right. As a doctor, cancer was normal. It was mundane. I would see 10, 12 women a week with breast cancer, and I didn't see the bad stuff. I would operate on them, and some would get passed on to the oncologists for chemo, or I would see them in a year's time. I didn't get how bad it was. And I think as a doctor, you have to distance yourself because you can't cry every time you break bad news. You'll just destroy yourself. So it just becomes normal. Although there's always cases that do make you cry. And when it was my turn to sit, squeezing my husband's hand, staring at the floor, waiting to go in to find out if I had bad news, I suddenly got it. I, no one is lucky to get a cancer early enough because it hasn't spread. It's still cancer. And that whole emotional roller coaster of, Am I going to die in two years' time? Will I still be alive? Can I plan? How do I get over never having children? How do I, the guilt you feel at bringing that into a relationship when the menopause affects your marriage, the, I had no idea. It's not just an operation in a word. Now, I, I've always thought cancer has a potential to be a portal into a more conscious life. Um, I, I think that you discover the value of time and the beauty in the day. And that seems to be something that runs through many people's cancer experiences. It's the same for me. I suddenly realized what was important in life was friends and family and making memories. And I didn't want to be remembered when I died for being a surgeon. I wanted to be remembered for all the joy I'd brought to other people and you do realize that you don't need half the things you have. And it's staying in touch, it's making friends, it's traveling, it's making new memories. It, that's what's important. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I I can certainly say for me, it's been a shift away from materialism. And really all I wanna have is my, my computer, maybe my microphone and um, my cameras. And I'm a perfectly happy camper. I still like a nice pair of shoes every now and then, but... Um... <laughs> If um, of all the changes you've encountered, and you, Matt, boy, you've been through a lot. What do you think? What do you take away from it? What is the deepest change that you see in your life? I think it's realizing that your life isn't a straight line, and you kind of learn this at school. But you think, right? I want. I like helping people. I want to be a doctor. I'm going to be a surgeon. I'll be a surgeon until I retire, and that's it. And you realize that life throws you curveballs and you need those curveballs to help you learn and grow along the way. And I think I now help far more people than I ever did as a consultant. And I just want everyone to realize it's okay if things don't work out, maybe they didn't work out for a reason and there's so much else you can do. I think often when you have a defined career, you are told this is it, there is only one way to go, do not pass go. And I think it's wrong. We need to send people out to explore the huge variety of life, but it's scary because I was suddenly unemployed, retired, 45, thinking, what do I do with my life? Who am I? And people tell you, go and do what you're passionate about. And you think, I have no passions because I've spent 20 years training to be a surgeon. I do not know what I like doing. And that is really, really hard. Now, you, you were always a triathlete too, weren't you? So and not at school. My Before I got married, my maiden name was Ball, like a football or a rugby ball. And I can't throw, hit or catch one to save my life. I hated sport. We used to have the communal showers. I did everything I could to get out of doing sport at school. But I did a bit of swimming. I did a bit of horse riding and nothing at university. And then I started dating my husband who started cycling. And I became a cycling widow. And I realized if I don't cycle with him, I will never see him at the weekends. And I got hooked into cycling. And then I thought, I'm bored of doing it because it's his sport. I want one for me. And I'm a typical kind of nerdy geek. I bought every single book and magazine on triathlon you could imagine. I read it. In my head, I was winning Ironman triathlons, but I hadn't actually done any. And my husband got so bored, he signed me up to do one before my 40th birthday. And that's how it all started. And I got the bug. There was something crazy about swimming. 
and then getting on a bike in a wet lycra onesie and then running once you stop the bike. Now, are you still competing? So things have changed. I did a, a sprint distance triathlon, which was 16 lengths of a pool and a 20 kilometer bike ride and a five kilometer run. I did that during chemo on my good week when I felt well, very, very, very slow. And I had to beg the organizers to let me do it saying I'll be sensible. But that feeling of I can achieve anything. It doesn't matter that I'm not fast, that I'm not competing. I can just get out there. And I'm lucky. I've got two arms and two legs that work. Many people don't. A year after I finished treatment, I did a half Ironman, which is an even longer distance. Again, very, very, very slowly. But when my cancer came back and I was trying to work out what to do, I didn't have the time to train in three sports and try and speak and try and write my book. And I was I just wasn't enjoying it. So I've gone back to what I loved, which is cycling. And I've now also really got into lifting weights in the gym because exercise is not just the aerobic exercise. You have to do the resistance training, especially for bone health after breast cancer. And I wasn't doing any. And I'm now really, really enjoying building my muscles and getting my body much stronger. Being strong, it feels good, doesn't it? It does. I love knowing that I can actually lift my body weight and I have the strength. And I've also had to realize I was doing triathlons and thinking about doing big goals because I thought other people thought I should. When you start getting a profile on social media and you start putting things out there, you think people expect things of you. And I was doing things to keep my say, audience happy, whereas they probably don't care what I'm doing. But I, I wasn't staying true to me. And I kind of bounce back and I, I do everything because I think I should. And I think, no, it's too much. What is your heart telling you? What is going to make you happy? And I've had to learn it's okay to say no to people. It's interesting you bring up social media. We're, we're both pretty active out there. And I have found, you know, I have kind of a travel contingent and I have a cancer contingent. It's kind of an odd combination. Um, but my favorite my favorite contingent is a cancer contingent. I enjoy the people because they're they're heartfelt. They're dealing with deep issues. They really um, have something to say in their lives that I think has um, import for all of us. I think you're right. I had no idea the cancer community existed before I was diagnosed. And I found several doctors with cancer who really helped me get through chemo. And it is a whole new world. And there's the good, there's the bad and the ugly. And there are times when it just gives me the lift and the support I need. But one of the bad things about following cancer patients is that some of them die. Yeah. And that can be really hard. And when I'm having a very low moment, there are times when I just don't want to be in that space. And it's great that I can go into it and come out of it when I need it. But I, no. don't, know how, I don't know how I'd have coped if it wasn't for cancer patients on social media, because I didn't see another cancer patient physically during my treatment. I had no one else to talk to and all my support was online. Yeah, um, online was just getting going when I was diagnosed. Um, and I, that, well, that was back in 2009. Um, you know, my, my doctor didn't believe in acupuncture, didn't believe in diet, didn't believe in any of these things that help you take charge of your own health. And that's really why I got started with Anti-Cancer Club was absolute frustration over the fact that um, I was very isolated and I saw a different path that empowered me. It didn't guarantee that I would be cured. It didn't guarantee that I would live, but it gave me a great deal of personal power in a situation where I really had very little power. And um, social media has turned out, I thought I would hate it. I did it to build the website and now I am hooked. I meet the best people from all over the world through social media. It's just amazing. You can ask anybody anything and most people are nice and will reply. And yeah, it's, it's just amazing. It's opened up the world. It really has. And, and I think in the cancer community, it's been really pivotal for so many people. It's been a place for people to find connection, to find advice. Um, there are some very good Facebook groups, you know, for different different issues that can really go deep into a topic. And uh, I think that's a huge service to to everybody. It's amazing. Plus, you can follow scientific conferences and you can ask doctors. I've asked quite a few oncologists just for advice about me and friends, and most of them will just reply. It's It just takes the pressure off. And I think we're all equal. Instead of being a nervous patient with a list of questions you're too embarrassed to ask your doctor, 
on Twitter, you can be brave, you can be confident, you can just ask someone, you've got nothing to lose. Same on Facebook and Instagram. I think that's a great way of redressing that power balance. Yeah, there, there is a power um, disbalance or unbalance, if you will, in medicine. You've seen it from both sides. Yeah. I, when I was first training, I used to have women who would come to me with inches of papers of trials they printed off the internet. This is kind of before the internet and phones took off. And I think, oh my God, it's a difficult patient. They've got all these trials I haven't heard of and I meant to be the expert and I hated it. And then I was a patient and suddenly I was the one researching trials that might stop my cancer coming back. And I felt so awkward emailing my doctor saying, could you have a look at this to suggest that I might know more than her? And it was just, I think as a doctor, you real you don't realize that every single patient's life is really important to them and they don't realize you're not investing all your time into helping them. As a patient, it's just one of two, three, four hundred you may treat a year. But when you're a patient, you are the most important cancer patient in your doctor's job. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. I, I've always seen, I saw my doctors as um, working for me um, to assist that. me with where I wanted to go. Um, I was intent on getting into a clinical trial at Stanford. And I told my oncologist I wanted him to open the door, which he he willingly did. But I was the one who did all the research, found this clinical trial, which was a vaccine trial, actually. And I wanted to do this in lieu of chemo, obviously. Um, but what was most interesting out of it, by pushing for this trial, I found out they had misdiagnosed my cancer. Wow. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I say to everybody, boy, don't just be a pain in the butt. Um, do what you need to do, research it, but take charge because um, it is it is your life and nobody is. Is, is as invested as you are. And your doctor may not like it, but they're not the one living with it. I, I had no idea what it was like to live with a cancer diagnosis. I thought I knew everything because I treated women. I saw them all the time. But until you are living with that bombshell of how it affects every single aspect of your life. You can't understand it. Now, in our society focuses on diagnosis and treatment, sometimes very effectively. But I personally, because I live it, but I, I personally find this post-treatment phase or the rest of your life, really, to be interesting from a psychological perspective, from a spiritual perspective. Um, and it's something that we don't address as a, no. we, we just don't address it. And to some extent we can't because our institutions aren't set up to do this, but I think we can address it through the power of story. Um, and, and I think that's where the wisdom lies in terms of trying to figure out this, this dance we do with mortality. I think you're right. I think for me, the hardest part was after a year when my surgeon said, I'll see you in a year. And when you've had chemo, you're seen regularly. And it was like, what happens next? How do I know if it's coming back? How do I cope with the side effects? How do I live? How do I cope with my husband? All of that. And when you can't hear from other people to realize what you're feeling is normal for them at that stage in their journey, you just go in this awful little whirlpool of despair. And I think against the stories. This is what it's like a year after diagnosis. This is what it's like a year after three. When you first think you have a recurrence, this is what it's like and this is what you do. That information we need to give to patients, but they've got to be ready to hear it. Because you don't want to hear about recurrence a day after your diagnosis. And when the surgeon is giving you good news saying, right, it's all gone. Oh, by the way, it might come back and kill you. It's very hard as a doctor to know when to tell patients that. And I almost think if it's hinted at at every point, every time you're seen, it will slowly sink in to say, right, when you're ready, you need to read this and this will help you on your way. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Bring, no, the timing of bringing up these issues is almost impossible. I spoke yeah. to somebody recently who was 18 years out and she decided to go back to work as a cancer coach. And she thought she had processed everything that to do with her, her experience. But going back to work as a coach brought everything up all over again 18 years later. I'm not surprised. I didn't realize that in some centers in the UK, you're entitled to pre counseling through Macmillan Charity. Mm -hmm. And I had it when my cancer came back because I was trying to work out could I go back to work? And speaking to a cancer coach was the best thing I did because it's anonymous. They don't know me from Adam. I can tell them anything. They're not my mum, my friend, my husband. 
And they've heard everyone say all the crazy stuff in my head before. For me, it was the guilt you feel when someone's cancer comes back and it's not yours. You want to have it because you don't want them to have Mets. And there's almost wanting your cancer to come back so you can stop waiting for it to happen. Oh, and yeah. And move on. And I told my mum and she said, you can't say that. But, but I think if you haven't had cancer, you don't get it. And not everybody with cancer feels that. But there are some days I just think the anxiety you go through every time you get a new symptom, you just think it's almost a disappointment when the scan is normal because you know you might have to go through that again. You will have to go through it again. Scanxiety is now part of your yeah, life. But you don't want it to come back. That's what I'm saying. But it's just that mental kind of yeah. it's so irrational. It, it it is irrational. I I think I think we get this idea implanted in our minds that it's inevitable it will come back. So you live in this very strange um, stress point of, uh, am I living? Am I dying? What's going on? What's going to happen? And I think that the key is to to be incredibly exquisitely present moment. Yes. But that takes an enormous amount of work and training, particularly we're all trained to be very analytical, to take charge, to plan. And that's really the antithesis of the way our society looks at things. So I used to worry about the numbers. What's my risk of recurrence? And what percentage of women are going to die? And, and I was just making myself ill. And then I realized I may have a 40% chance of being alive in 10 years, but I don't know whether I'm in the 40% or the 60%. And for me, the chance of my cancer coming back is 50-50. It happens or it doesn't. And I can do everything. I can eat well. I can exercise. I can do everything you can. And it may still come back. I don't have any control. And that really, really helped me. I just live my life now. I, I make plans. And if something happens, I deal with it. But I can't put my life on hold. I can't make people hate me because I'm worrying all the time. I've got people I go to when I'm having a wobble who get it, and then it, it's done, right? Move on. But it's that you don't know what is going to happen. No, but that's actually reality for everybody. Yeah. It just, it, it's an awakening when you're dealing with something like cancer. It really is. Yeah. The, the question I love to ask, if you could rewrite your story, would you? And how would you rewrite it? Ooh. Is that? That's really interesting. And it's when, what time point I would rewrite my story. And I guess you're saying, would I rewrite the cancer diagnosis? Um, I honestly don't think I would. I am, I'm a better person for having cancer. I am more fulfilled. I found an inner strength I never knew I had. I've got a massive friendship circle. I've just, I've developed a new zest for life. And before I got cancer, I was a surgeon doing long hours. It was all about the patients. It was me and my husband and very little outside. And I thought that would be it until I was 60. And although it was horrific having cancer and I wouldn't want it again, the positives that have come from it, I think, outweigh the negatives. What? Which, yeah, isn't that crazy? No, no, I, I don't think it is. I think that actually many people who face a bump in the road hit a, a point of, they either hit a point of transformation or they don't. And transformation is hard. It's really, really difficult. But the positive things that can come out of it are just astonishing. And it takes you places you would never expect and you never could have anticipated. And maybe that's a good life lesson in that we should let go of some of our expectations and just see where life takes us. I think I wish I'd spoken to you about 20 years ago. I plan. I plan everything. I have a conversation with my husband in my head and imagine what he will say and then act on it. And <laughs> to have that almost that forced spontaneity. You don't know what's going to happen. You can't plan anything. Just relax a bit and let go and see where life takes you. Have fun. Yes, fun. Fun is so key. It's 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 important. <laughs> so I, no, I I haven't shared this with many people. The day before my mastectomy, when I was about to lose my breast, 
Um, we live near some farmer's fields and my husband and I walked through them and I stripped off topless in the middle of a cornfield and he took a photo. I would never do that before. And I've never shown it to anyone, but just that kind of feeling of you can do anything within reason and just let go and see who you really are. What advice would you give to somebody facing their own bump in the road? I would say there are no rules. Um, you go through it at the right time for you, not how your mum or your friend or someone on the TV says. You, and it's almost like the stages of grieving. You have those days where you just want to nest. You want to wallow in pity and cry in the chair and say it's really not fair. But then you do have to pull your backside out of sling and start acting on it. The world will tell you how to cope. Everybody will give you two pence of their opinion. And I used to get really cross when people said, oh, my mum had cancer and they died. And well, that's really helpful. They're just, they don't know what to say because you're not taught at school how to talk to someone who's got bad news. And saying something is better than nothing. And I've learned just to say thank you and move on. Um, you have to learn from the mistakes. You need to have failures. You have to give yourself a break. and you will find the strength to get through it because you have no other choice. Just don't try and analyze. As you said, you just you just live in the moment and you go through and you'll suddenly get this feeling of this is what I need to do. It's how you connect with your heart and just think this is what I need to do to get out of this. Not what other people think I should. But it's really hard in this time of social media. The, the cancer space has just exploded and there are so many people potentially living fabulous lives and we don't share the bad days the hard days the spotty days the crying in the shower days we don't share that side of ourselves and I think maybe we should so people know it's normal well I, I think you need to share that because um you know you don't know hot until you know cold you no. don't know dark until you know light so until you shed light on those difficult times you can't really appreciate the high points no you can't and it's realizing that everything you see on social media is often heavily edited and tweaked and people are showing you what they want you to see. And it's often very far from the reality. But you will get through it. Just breathe. And music. Music was the one thing that really, really helped me. There's always a song that just makes your shoulder jiggle or your head nod. And you can't, you can't frown if you're singing along to something stupid in the car. And I've got kind of a playlist of silly, happy songs. Well, it's often ABBA, something that will just make me go, yeah, okay. I have to smile when this song is on. If you find something like that, it doesn't matter how bad you are, but that can just snap you out of a bad mood. Liz, thank you so much for being on today. I, I really appreciate it. It is always such a pleasure to talk to you. And, and just thank you for being on A Bump in the Road. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, Pat. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.